Well, thank you, Elva. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, like the Elva said, I think it's a it's a pleasure to be back at uh, A and M Commerce. It was East Texas State when I came here back in the '70s, but uh, got the call and. Uh, I was more than glad to come and, and share some of my experiences with you. Uh, I've gotten to do this uh, a couple of times while I was in Korea at uh, Yonsei University, Seoul National, and Iwa Women's University. But this time it's kind of different because going the opposite way. Uh, in those classes we were talking a little about what it was like you know, to do business, uh, what business was like in the U.S. So uh, it's, I think it's kind of fun to get a chance to, to finally try it the other way. But uh, please stop me, ask questions. Uh, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. But uh, if you don't ask questions, I'll warn you it'll get very boring. I'll probably put you to sleep, probably put myself to sleep, okay? So uh, be sure and ask lots of questions. So what I uh, would like to do, the, the name of my presentation is called uh, Going Global. Uh, this is the name of, uh, at that time, this was our Chrysler uh, expatriate uh, HR handbook. So I, I plagiarized heavily. So I can say that on the tape, that it uh, borrowed a lot from our HR handbook to sort of give me some uh, thought starters because, you know, as you get old, you start to forget things. What I'd like to do is just tell you a little bit about myself, my background, what I've done, uh, where I've been, and, uh, you know, why you might be interested in working abroad, you know, maybe some thought starters for yourself, you know, what does it take, uh, what's your motivation, uh, you know, after being overseas for almost 20 years, what I think might be some important characteristics to think about, uh, some options as far as getting into that if you decide to go that way. And then, uh, as I said, uh, lots of time for a Q&A because, uh, you know, I think uh, you are probably will all learn more from your questions than, than probably what I've got to say. All right? So let's get into it. Uh, well, I grew up on a family farm. At that time, between uh, Garland and Saxe, Texas. Now, as you know, the Dallas Metroplex has all kind of grown together. We were really surprised when we came back and, and see how much it's really grown up around here. And uh, when we did come back, my oldest daughter, uh, Jessica, in this picture, she was a little younger. That was uh, back in 2005, I think, was looking for a place to go to school. So I suggested, let's go take a look at. Uh, my old alma mater at Commerce. So we came back and uh, I've got to say I was really pleasantly surprised to see uh, the growth in the campus, uh, the number of students, uh, the attitude of the, uh, and the enthusiasm uh, of the faculty and talking to Dr. Jones and uh, Randy Van Dieven. So uh, she was very excited. So uh, now she is a, a junior here majoring in uh, agribusiness with a minor, I think, in animal science. A little bit about myself, uh, I came here uh, growing up on a farm. Uh, my original plan was to teach uh, agriculture, ag education. That's what I majored in with a minor in uh, farm power and machinery. At that time, the ag department was headed by a gentleman, uh, you may have heard about him, named Buck Hughes. Uh, Dr. Hughes was uh, quite a colorful character, had a lot of colorful language that uh, you probably couldn't get away with in the classes today. But uh, just to give you a little background, uh, you've probably read stories, history stories, about the uh, battleship, the Indianapolis, that carried the first atomic bomb to Tiananmen Island in the Pacific. And that after they dropped off the bomb, it was, it was sunk by a Japanese uh, submarine. And uh, out of the, I don't know, 2,000 or so that were on board, there was only several hundred survived after uh, spending a lot of time in the water with the sharks. Dr. Hughes was one of the survivors, so uh, he was quite a colorful character as head of the department, so uh, it was quite an exciting time back then to come to Commerce. Uh, back then, we were known for our football. Uh, we had some, some good teams back then. Uh, Harvey Martin was here, and uh, I think the team was won the uh, national uh, championship for I think it was Division 2A at that time. But, uh, so I had a lot of fun here and hope you enjoy coming here too. But anyway, uh, as it says up there, I got my uh, bachelor's degree in uh, 1976. And uh, I'd taken a pretty heavy class load. I was commuting a lot. I was working uh, in the Dallas area at Kraft Foods in a maintenance on the third shift. 
And uh, when I got to my senior year, I only liked a couple of, of classes, so Dr. Hughes suggested I go ahead and uh, start taking some of my master's courses. So really my senior year, other than two, the two classes I needed to graduate, was uh, working on my master's, so I got that then in December of 77. And uh, a funny story, like I said, uh, I came here, my uh, plan was to have a career in teaching agriculture, and I came up here with some of my friends, a lot of them did become ag teachers. But uh, one year, uh, back then, and I'm sure they still do it today, this school was very big on trying to make sure that as the students graduated, they had jobs. And they always had jobs fairs, and they were over in the old, uh, all the basketball courts over by the stadium. Um, at that time, I already had a job lined up. I was going to teach ag in Waxhatchee, Texas. I did my student teaching there. That was all taken care of. But a friend of mine, a fraternity brother, was going to go to this career day. And uh, he wanted me to go with him. I said, yeah, okay, I'll go along. So I went along with him just to kind of hang out so he'd have somebody with him. And as we were uh, going through and he was talking to the different people, um, I struck up a, a conversation with, uh, at that time, International Harvester was a, a very big company. And they had a, a table. And I struck up a conversation with uh, one of the guys there. And we seemed to hit it off. And we talked back and forth. And he asked me, you know, uh, what I was planning to do. And I said, yeah, I already had a job. I was going to teach ag. And, and we got to talking and uh, talked a little bit about my background. He talked a little bit about the company. And then uh, he said, uh, well, what are they going to start you off being an ag teacher? And I was very proud. I said, at that time, now you got to remember this was back in 76. Uh, I said, yeah, I'm, I've already got a job. I'm going to teach ag in Waxhatchee, Texas. Starting salary was, I think, $11,800. Well, I, you know, that was, to me, that was a lot of money after working part-time, making minimum wage. And uh, he says, well, uh, what if I offer you a job making $32,000 a year? So uh, at that point, the ag career sort of went out the window. <laughs> And uh, I did go to work for International Harvester. At that time, uh, again, they were a very large company. They made everything from consumer items, uh, washing machines, refrigerators, deep freezes, air conditioners, farm equipment, construction equipment, uh, heavy over-the-road trucks, which that's really all that's left of the company anymore if you're familiar with Navistar, some of the bigger trucks. But I went to work in the regional office, um, started me out putting together uh, farm implements back in the warehouse. That's where I got my start. Um, eventually came a uh, district service rep. Uh, they moved me to a, a zone office out in Lubbock that covered uh, West Texas, New Mexico, Colorado, the western half of Oklahoma, a little bit of Kansas. And started off as a district service rep, uh, then became an area sales manager. And uh, my last job with IH was as a uh, regional marketing manager. Um, that at that time, uh, IH had a new CEO named Archie McArdle that had come over from IBM. And of course, uh, the uh, UAW was a very strong union in our manufacturing plants, and Archie decided he was going to bust the unions. Well, you know, good luck with that. The auto companies never had much luck. So uh, after about five years of strikes, I think they finally gave up. Um, they came back to work, but then. Uh, the country sort of went into a, a little bit of a recession. That's about the time of the, of the big gas shortage. And uh, by then the company was in some real trouble. They started selling off divisions. They sold off uh, construction to Dresser. And they sold the uh, ag division along with the IH logo to uh, a company called Tenneco that owned uh, J.I. Case Company. And they merged Case with uh, IH. Um, and at that time, I was working in the uh, farm equipment division, so I went to uh, the new company and stayed for about a year um, to see how that would work out. Uh, but uh, J.I. Case was sort of a small company, and IH had been a very big company, so I guess uh, it was sort of like the, uh, the minnow swallowing the whale. And uh, I didn't see much of a future because... Uh, they had a nickname called for us. They called us the Fibs, and you can figure out what that stood for. It was something international, boys. So uh, decided that probably wasn't going to be the, the best future for my career. And uh, at that time, I was living in Amarillo, Texas as a zone sales manager. And uh, a friend of mine that I'd worked with 
that IH had left before the, uh, the merger took place, and he'd gone to work for Chrysler. And he called me up and said, hey, you know, this is a great company. You know, Lee Iacocca has saved it. It's coming back strong. Uh, you, you really ought to, you ought to come take a look. So I told him, yeah, 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 I'll think about it. And then uh, got a call from him about a month later. He was in town with the, uh, the zone manager from Dallas and wanted to have dinner. So we met and have dinner. And they talked to me. They had a position open. Uh, didn't have to move. I could stay in Amarillo. So I left. Uh, the ag equipment uh, business and went to work for the car business. So you never know where your life's going to end up or, or what kind of strange turns uh, your life may take. Again, started out to teach agriculture and now I'm in the car business. Um, had met my wife. Uh, we had gotten married. Uh, my wife, Joan, worked for American Airlines. So uh, we got to do some traveling with her flight benefits, and we had been to Europe, and we'd been to Asia. In fact, uh, it was kind of strange. I think in 1989, some flight attendant said that a great place to go Christmas shopping was Itaewon in Seoul, South Korea. So along with some of her friends, we loaded up and flew to South Korea and went on a shopping spree, you know, never knowing that we might be living there someday, which was kind of ironic, I think. But uh, we, we had talked privately and, you know, that, gee, someday maybe if an international position came open, boy, wouldn't it be fun to work international. But this time we were uh, living in, in St. Louis, Missouri, and uh, first daughter, Jessica, it's like I said, she's in school now. She, she had just been born. And uh, the HR people from Detroit were in town and doing personnel reviews. And... Uh, they came in, sat down with me, and, and said, well, we, we think you're a, you have high potential, and uh, we think it's about time that you came to Detroit. And uh, without thinking, I just, you know, being a, a small farm boy from Texas and, and not really liking cold weather, I said, oh, God, I'll go anywhere but Detroit. Two weeks later, I was on a plane to Tokyo. <laughs> um, at that time, we were... Chrysler was just starting, after the recovery, was starting to get back in the international business and had, uh, as you probably know, they had bought American Motors and taken over Jeep. And that's really what Christ got Chrysler back in the international business because Jeep was basically, it's, it's a global brand. It's sold internationally. It's, uh, you know, along with Coke and I think uh, Levi's, it's one of the top three or four recognized brands in the world. And in fact, it was, it was sort of funny when we were in China that I learned one of the first English words that Chinese children learn in school is Jeep. So uh, we went over, had an interview, uh, and I took a position as the uh, regional service uh, technical operations manager. And uh, we moved to uh, Tokyo in 1994 and went to work there, and then I was covering service operations for all of Asia, which at that time basically covered everything, Japan to Australia, Thailand, Singapore, um, and of course Korea and China. Then uh, happened to be in, in Korea in uh, early 1996. In fact, we were doing some training seminars and uh, this was just before the uh, Asian economic crisis hit. And uh, our distributor, the parent company, was getting in some financial trouble and they declared bankruptcy. So since I happened to be there, the uh, regional director called me up and says, well, can you stay and kind of you know, mine the fort and make sure the product doesn't, doesn't disappear? And uh, We got to taking a look at the operation, decided that uh, there was good potential in Korea, so we set up a, a wholly owned uh, subsidiary, Chrysler Korea, in 1996, and I was appointed to head up that operation. So uh, at that time, second daughter had been born in Tokyo, so I've got one made in Japan, and uh, we, we packed up and moved from Japan to, uh, to Seoul. Now, when we first took the international assignment, you know, we were thinking, you know, hey, you know, this looks good, you know, it's good background, it's good for your career to have some some international experience in a resume. So we were thinking maybe, you know, three, five years maximum. Well, we've been in Tokyo, uh, like I said, 94 to 96 for two years, so we decided, well, okay, 
you know, this would be fun. Let's go try running the operations in Korea. So uh, we went up, moved over there then uh, in the fall of uh, 1996, set up the operation. And it's, it's kind of funny the way things work out. You, you get involved in things that, that you never thought that you would whenever you take these, and we'll get into that as I get a little further into the operation. But, you know, you start running into regulatory problems, uh, non-tariff barriers. Uh, you know, they can do a lot of things to try to keep uh, products out of their markets. Um, you know, here in the U.S., I think we're very blessed. We have a very open market. Uh, the requirements to bring any products in here are pretty minimal, and that's one of the things I told these uh, the international business classes when I did this uh, in Korea. But uh, some of these countries make it very difficult, and uh, I think it's important as you go out that you understand the cultures of where you're going. You need to study the country, understand the history. Because when you think about it, you know, here we are in the U.S., we're less than 250 years old, and you go to places like Japan, Korea, and uh, China, you know, their cultures are 5,000 years old. And uh, they're a very homogeneous society. Um, to have a, a, a Japanese or Korean passport, for example, your father has to be Japanese or Korean. Not just your mother, but your father has to be. So there, it's a very homogeneous society, you know, unlike here in the U.S. where we're sort of known as the, the melting pot of all cultures. And when you look at uh, especially a country like Korea over their thousands of years of history, they've been invaded over 900 times. So they're a little bit suspicious of anything <laughs> foreign, whether it be products or people. So uh, they uh, did a lot of things to try to keep us from bringing our vehicles into the market. Well to try to work around that, then you get involved working with the local government as far as regulatory requirements. You get involved with things like our government through the U.S. Embassy, through the U.S. Ambassador, and also a big help uh, as you go to some of these foreign markets, there's always an American Chamber of Commerce there. So uh, to try to uh, help crack open the market a little bit and make it a little easier for, us, for our dealers to sell our product, I got very involved with the, the AmCham, uh, served two terms as the chairman of that. Um, by doing that, also working with the Korean government uh, during the uh, economic crisis, um, worked with uh, the Korean government. I served on their, uh, their Foreign Direct Investment Advisory Council to the president, so got to make several trips and we had some nice dinners at the Blue House, that's the equivalent of the, the White House in Korea. It's called the Blue House because it has a blue tiled roof on it. Um, so worked on that uh, council with the president. Um, also uh, with AmCham, at that time during the economic crisis, uh, there were a lot of, of Korean children that were dropping out of college because their parents were losing jobs and they had to go home and work. And there really wasn't the infrastructure that you have here as far as uh, uh, the social security uh, safety nets, so to speak. Um, also, scholarships were basically, there really weren't any. So, uh, with the help of a friend of mine, uh, Jeff Jones, who was a, an attorney, we set up a uh, scholarship foundation called Partnership for the Future. And we got 10 companies and AmCham to Annie up. We all ended up $100,000 apiece and set up this foundation to award scholarships to Korean children so they could continue their education. Um, so between working on the uh, Foreign Direct Investment Board, setting up the scholarship, uh, in 2005 I was made an honorary citizen, which was uh, at that time a, a pretty big deal because they really didn't do that too much. And then uh, also was given an honorary doctorate in 2006. And the picture on this slide is uh, Imun Bak. At that time, he was the mayor of Seoul. He's now the president of South Korea. So, why work abroad? Uh, you've probably heard the U.S. Army uh, advertisement, it's not a job, it's an adventure. Well, I promise you, it, it is an adventure. Um, really? You, you don't understand it until you get outside of, of the country. I mean, when you're in the U.S., if you're in a classroom someplace, probably in high school or even junior high, and you see a, a world map, the U.S. is in the center, right? 
But when you go to these other countries, guess what? It's not. So it, it kind of gives you a really different thought process when you start looking at how other people look at the world. Um, again, I mentioned cultural differences. Uh, well, Japan, Korea, and China are all uh, heavy uh, Confucianism, Confucian countries. Um, the way they look at women, I mean, it's very difficult for women in business. It's, it's changing now, but when I first went there, uh, it was very difficult. You talk about a glass ceiling, it, it's nothing compared to what you hear people complain about in the U.S. It's very different there. Uh, with the exception of China, because uh, under Mao and communism, uh, you find a lot of women in uh, high positions. In fact, uh, when I first got to China, the, uh, the CEO of our company was uh, Madame Mao, and uh, this lady, we call her the Dragon Lady, but she was the CEO of Beijing Jeep. So, uh, quite interesting. But again, it, it gives you a chance to uh, see how other people look at the world, how they look at life. You know, when you grow up in the U.S., or especially like I did on a, in a small town, a small farm, never really traveled that much. Uh, it, it was quite an experience to, to get to understand. Like I said, you know, it's very good. I think Chrysler, when they first sent us to Japan, they sent us to, uh, oh, I think, uh, what do you call it, uh, Cultural Charm School at uh, University of Colorado in Boulder, and we spent three weeks there learning a little bit about the language, a little bit about the culture, the do's and the don'ts. So I, I think that was very helpful um, when you start trying to think about how to deal with other cultures. And again, like I said, uh, when you look at uh, Korea, for example, uh, being very suspicious of anything foreign and, and very difficult to crack open the market. So it, it really makes you think you have to, uh, to learn understand and uh, you know I think it's a to me it's a great opportunity you know we, we've talked many times uh, again we started to go overseas for three to five years wound up staying about 20 and uh, people ask uh, you know how could you do that and you know I always say if I had to do it all over again I, I wouldn't change a thing you know I think it's been great it's been a great experience for myself my wife and also I think for both our daughters growing up um, because uh, in these different cultures like Japan, Korea, China, the kids really study. I mean, they go to, uh, even in, especially high school, junior high, high school. You know, they go to class all day, then they're going to private schools at night, all the way up to midnight. Because in uh, these societies and cultures, when they take like, uh, uh, I guess it would be comparable to our ACT or SAT. Your scores on those tests determine what, if you go to a college, which college you go to, and really what career path you will be. Whether you'll be a lawyer, a doctor, a politician, that's how much these scores mean. So the parents invest very heavily in the, the children's education because these test scores will determine what career path they can take. So that was kind of interesting. So uh, I think it helped our girls uh, maybe develop some uh, study habits they might not have developed uh, otherwise. And uh, Since coming back here, it was been a little difficult because they've had sort of a, a reverse expat experience because uh, you know they, they really weren't foreign students. You know, they're not natives of Japan or, or Korea or China, but they're really not natives of the U.S. either. And in fact, it was sort of interesting when they, they, they came back and started trying to, you know, make friends and meet classmates. And uh, they'd come back and, and tell us, Mom, Dad, uh, you know, th these kids aren't from another country. They're from a, they're from a different planet because they're so different because their view of the world is so different from, from maybe what the local kids are. But uh, I think it's also helped them. Uh, Jessica's in her junior year, like, year, like I said here, she's... Uh, on the honor dean's list in the National Honor Society. Uh, the youngest is now a junior in high school at Wiley East. She's number four in her class and also in the National Honor Society. So uh, I think it's, it's been a good experience for them. Um, Self-understanding, 
you know, you really learn a lot about, about yourself. Like I said, you know, growing up on a small family farm, not traveling much, and then being thrown into this type of environment, uh, you have to learn a lot of things. Uh, probably the biggest is patience, which I probably didn't have a lot of. Um, you also will learn uh, in doing business in some of these markets. Uh, you know, here it's all about the deal and, and getting the contract on paper. Um, and what you'll find in a, a lot of instances when you're working abroad is it's all about the relationships. You know, how well do you know the people? How well do they know you? Because, uh, you know, they deem the relationship a failure if once you've signed a contract, if you ever have to pull it out and read it. That's the way they look at doing business. Language skills. Uh, I encourage both of my girls. They both uh, know a little bit of Korean because that's mainly where they went to school was in South Korea. But uh, if I had a, a piece of advice for anyone now, I'd say learn Mandarin. Because, uh, you know, right now, you're very lucky and very fortunate because uh, the international business language is English. If you see Chinese doing business with Koreans or Koreans doing business with Japanese, they do it in English. Even if both sides have to have interpreters, they conduct their business in English. But uh, when you look at uh, China, the size of its economy, the number of people, and the way that uh, economy has just exploded, I mean, you know, for years, the U.S. has been, just in my industry, has been the largest car market in the world forever. But uh, China has blown past the U.S. and continues to grow, and they're up around 20 million vehicles per year now in China. And I think the U.S. are predicting about 14 million here in the U.S. this year. So it's uh, rapidly growing. So uh, if I had a piece of advice uh, to anyone that's, that's thinking about it, learn Mandarin. Okay, I think I've talked a little bit about this. Oh, and like I said, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the pictures. Uh, this picture, I'm standing in front of the uh, National Assembly. This is uh, Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. Now, there are two Mongolias. Uh, there's an inner and an outer Mongolia. Inner Mongolia is part of China. Outer Mongolia was part of the old Soviet Union, and after the Soviet Union fell apart, uh, Outer Mongolia became an independent country. Um, the capital is in Ulaanbaatar. Uh, you talk about learning about different ethnic backgrounds, different people. Uh, that, was, that was quite an experience. Uh, I only went there in the summertime. We did have a distributor and a dealer there because uh, the winters are, are very, very cold. Uh, we did go there one winter. We set up uh, a Jeep winter test drive on a frozen lake, and that was quite an experience. I mean, you could stand on the ice, you were watching the fish. <coughs> but it was about 20 degrees below zero. Uh, but we did have a lot of customers fly in, and uh, we did that for a couple of weeks. That, that was a lot of fun. But uh, I got to tell you, you did not you had to make sure you didn't have any skin exposed because it would immediately freeze. It was quite an ordeal. But uh, yeah, it, was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, went out and visited some uh, camel herders out in the desert. Uh, they live in these big tents, you know, and you, you just can't believe they survived the winter like that. But they're, they're lined with all these beautiful Persian rugs, and they treat you great. They drink a lot. They like to wrestle and fight, so it's not unusual, you know, when they get a little drunk that they want to wrestle or fight with you, so. It was a lot of fun. But, uh, you know, like I said, being flexible, and, uh, you know, again, the, maybe the, the one drawback is, you know, you are away from home, you're away from your family, your normal support groups. Uh, you know, I think that Chrysler was very generous. Uh, you know, we got 30 days home leave. They flew us all home every year, so we got to come home for, for a month out of the year. But, uh, you know, you are away. But uh, it is a very good opportunity because uh, you find that you're very quickly, you know, you are the minority. Maybe you're not used to that, but uh, especially in some of these societies, especially Japan and Korea, you know, you, you definitely are the minority. So uh, you, you get to learn a little bit about what discrimination is about that maybe you didn't know before. 
but uh, and you also make some very good friends because uh, you'll find that the the expat community is a very tight knit because number one there's not that many of us and uh, so we lean on each other for for help and support and we made some very good uh, you know lifelong friends in fact both of my daughters did too um, Jessica last summer went back to Shanghai she's met some friends in Florida and uh, now that I'm retired we plan to do some some traveling and visit a lot of our friends so it's uh, I think it's, it's a great opportunity to meet people and, and make new friends um, you got to be able to cope with uncertainty because uh, for sure whatever you got planned uh, doesn't work out uh, I can give you one good story. We were uh, trying to think where I was. I think I was Xi'an in China, and uh, had been meeting with a the dealer there, and it was time to get to the airport. So they were taking me to the airport, and there was some road construction, and uh, got into a traffic jam. So they were afraid I was going to miss my plane. So they stopped this guy on a motorcycle and asked him if he would take me to the airport. So here I am in a suit and tie, got my briefcase in one hand, my hanging bag in the other on the back of this motorcycle, and we're weaving through the traffic to the airport. And all this road construction, of course, the dirt's flying and the dust. So he gets me to the airport, get in, get checked in, get to the gate. Well, the plane's not there. So finally... Uh, got a hold of one of the uh, agents there that could speak some English. Well, uh, they'd had a mechanical, so the plane was about two and a half hours late. So there I was, <laughs> rode this motorcycle, covered up in dust. And uh, back then it was quite an experience riding a, an airplane in, in China, too. This was a uh, China Southern flight, I believe. But it was a brand new Boeing 757. And uh, it finally did arrive. We finally started to load up and uh, got in my seat. And then, of course, the, the local Chinese, they're, they're coming on. Um, they've got uh, live chickens and little coops that they're putting in the overhead bins, which I thought was kind of special. And then uh, they taxied out, started to take off since they were behind. Well, about half the people weren't seated. When he took off, I think he pointed the nose straight up. Half the people in the aisle rolled to the back of the plane. <laughs> and then uh, once we got up, we were, I was flying, I think, from there back to Hong Kong. So it was about a three-hour flight. And, uh, you know, it comes time to eat. Well, these people, they get in the overhead bins, and they, they let down the little trays, break out their sterno heat, and start cooking. And, of course, the smoke alarms are going off, and you've got smoke <laughs> all on the plane. And I thought, oh, God if I ever get out of this alive. <laughs> but, uh, so yeah, it's, uh, you, can, uh, you can run into some, some strange experiences. And uh, when it comes to eating some meals, uh, those can be kind of strange. Uh, you know, since uh, you're the guest, uh, just uh, go with the flow. Don't ask what it is. Just at least try it. You may like it. You may not like it. But I promise you, you don't want to know what it is, especially in China. <laughs> Okay, why do this? You know, what would make you want to work abroad? Well, like I said, uh, you know, to me, uh, it gives you an experience that uh, you, you can't get any place else. Uh, until you've been there, you know, it, it's hard for me to stand up here and explain it to you. But I, it really broadens your horizons. You really get a different perspective on what the, the world's about. And you really start to understand, uh, you know, how the global economy, everything fits together. I mean, you know, we're to the point now that uh, so much of the U.S. debt belongs to China. You know, if, if they sneeze, we catch pneumonia, I guess is, is sort of the way some people put it. But it's really surprising, you know, how interlocked all the economies are around the world, whether it's South America, Europe, Asia, and the U.S. Uh, it really is uh, a global economy now. It's really not uh, a single entity. Uh, you really can't isolate yourself anymore. Like, like they could back in uh, maybe when I was younger and or, or in our parents' day. It's, it's just not possible. It really is a global environment. And, uh, and I think it's great if you get an opportunity to get out there and, and see what it's all about. So why do this? You know, you know think about what you want to do, 
where you want to go, how long do you want to do it. Like I said, my intention was to maybe do it three to five years. And I wound up overseas for 20 years, and I, I thought it was great. You know, if I had to do it again, I'd do it all today. You know, your own expectations, how does it fit in with your uh, career goals, and, you know, how important is this? You know, is this something that I really want to try to do? And, of course, uh, a lot of people, you know, about the money, um, it is a good opportunity because, uh, you know, you do make some good money. Uh, most companies uh, may not be as good as it once was from whatever we first went over, but you'll find that company pays things like your housing. Um, they pay for your kids' schooling. I mean, it was very strange to come back to the U.S. and have to drive ourselves because we really weren't allowed to drive in these countries, so we had drivers. Uh, my wife hated coming back because now she has to keep her own house because we always had housekeepers <laughs> for the past 20 years. So she would kind of, she says, can't we go back? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and it does give you a good opportunity to save some money. I mean, uh, my plan, I was really going to retire at 55, but uh, I hung around a couple more years because we were enjoying it. So I retired at 57. But, you know, when uh, the company's paying those type of things, it does give you an opportunity to save. And, again, I think uh, both of my daughters got a, an education that they would have never gotten if, if we hadn't have done this. So, for me, I think it was the right choice. Like I said, you got to, uh, I think you got to be flexible. Have to be. Because, uh, and a sense of humor. Because uh, there's going to be stuff happening to you that you just cannot imagine and cannot believe. So uh, you've got to keep a, a sense of humor and be able to laugh at yourself. And uh, again, your ability to uh, adapt and you know, how well do you handle stress because uh, I can promise you you're going to be stressed. <laughs> and uh, you know, one thing is you're, you're a long way from headquarters. You're on the other side of the world. Uh, you know, when you're eating lunch, people, it's midnight here. People are in bed. So uh, a lot of it is you're on your own. You know, you don't have people looking over your shoulder. You're running the business. You're making the decisions. And uh, unlike, uh, I think, working in a, a big organization or a business here, you know, you can really see the impact of, of what you do when you're working overseas. You know, if you really want to see... Um, what type of impact you're having on the business or, or be able to impact the business. I think this is a great way to go. Again, like I said, patience. You're really going to need lots of patience. Uh, have to have a sense of adventure, I think, to embark on one of these uh, adventures. And uh, a willingness to learn new ways of doing things. Uh, one of the things that we got involved in, uh, just to, to explain a little bit about this picture. This is uh, General B.B. Bell. Uh, he was the uh, commander of uh, U.S. Forces Asia. Um, while in Korea, I also got involved with uh, the USO because there is a, you know, a very large uh, U.S. military presence in South Korea because, uh, as you know from history, uh, there never was uh, an end to the war. It's simply a, an armistice with North Korea. So uh, we're there protecting the border. Uh, I've got to go up to the DMZ. Uh, also got to stand out on the bridge of, of no return. I've got some pictures with the, the North Korean guards in the background standing in the middle of that bridge, which was, was kind of eerie. Um, but there's, I guess, other than perhaps uh, the fence around Guantanamo base in Cuba, there's no other place like that in the world anymore. So if you ever get a chance to go there, it's, uh, it's really something to see. A lot of wildlife there because there's no people. So you see lots of uh, wildlife, but it's also very dangerous. Uh, one of the, the small bases up there, they have a, a golf course. It's called the most dangerous golf course in the world because uh, if you hit in the rough, you don't go after your golf ball because it's minefield. <laughs> so that was quite interesting to play around the golf on that little, <laughs> little course. But uh, got involved with the USO because in South Korea, very different than most places, uh, civilians can have access to the base. And of course, you can't go to the uh, 
you know, you can't uh, go to the grocery stores or any of that, uh, the PX and that sort of stuff. But as far as our kids, uh, you know, being able to uh, have some interaction with other Americans, it, it gave them a good opportunity. Um, they both played like baseball and soccer. Uh, they took Taekwondo on the base. And uh, one of the ways to gain access, oh, and also you could go like to the bowling. They had a bowling alley. They had a movie theater. Um, and they had some, some nice restaurants. In fact, they had a lot of the fast food. So when we get cravings for Taco Bell or Burger King, this was, this was the way to go. So uh, I got involved with the USO. I became, uh, served about seven years as, as president of the local organization supporting the troops. Uh, most of that was charity work, doing fundraising and uh, got to be very good friends with, with a lot of the commanders and uh, was uh, given a, an award by, by General Bill when we left for my work with the USO. So again, you know, outside of the job, you'll, you'll find yourself getting involved in a lot of different things. So uh, that, that was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed that, getting to know those people and, and working with our troops because again, uh, you know, these are all probably 18 to 20 year olds that have never been out of uh, their hometown or maybe never traveled much, and here they are in a, a foreign country serving in the military. So it was nice to be able to, you know, bring them a, a piece of home to them while they were serving overseas. So really enjoyed that time. Okay, if you want to do this, what are some of the options? Um, well, there's, there's several different things. A, a lot of companies, uh, they have internships. If you search online, a big way I think people get started is by teaching. There is, a, especially in Asia, in Japan, Korea, and China, there is a big demand for English teachers because they all want to learn English. Again, as I said, right now, English is uh, the international language of business, with the exception of the French because I think everybody should, should speak French. But uh, there's good opportunities there. Uh, a, a lot of people go over teaching English. Another way is NGOs. That's non-government organizations. Uh, things like the Peace Corps. Um, Habitat for Humanity. Uh, Jessica spent two summers in the Philippines building schools, which I think was a, a very good opportunity. Uh, there's different professional, religious uh, research, uh, a lot of uh, that operate on nonprofit basis is a good way maybe to get your foot into the door. Um, a lot of companies are looking for maybe short-term work if you don't want to do this like I said like I did for a career or maybe you just want to get a taste of it maybe six months assignments and then of course what I did uh, you know there are opportunities with, with most large companies as Korea career ex, expatriates. Uh, the auto industry uh, most big companies, banking, insurance, you name it, just about any industry, and of course agriculture. I mean, uh, Purina, uh, Carlisle, a lot of these companies uh, have very big operations in China now. In fact, uh, most of the pet food, dog food, I think now not nearly all of it's made in China, as is everything you buy. <laughs> okay, uh, this picture. Um, this is in Shihan, and uh, that's the, the soldiers. Thousands of years ago, the, one of the first emperors of China buried, uh, had, had his whole army, so in the afterlife he would be able, he thought he would have this army. And they built these uh, huge buildings over the digs to try to protect it, but they're, they're still excavating and, and digging these up, and there are just thousands and thousands of soldiers, Chariots, horses, weapons, you wouldn't believe it. It's, it's, uh, it's really something else to see those. Okay, I think I, I've talked enough. Uh, hope I didn't bore you too bad. Hope uh, you helped learn a little bit. But uh, this is a picture of uh, we had a uh, Jeep Jamboree in Korea, and this is on top of a mountain. As you can see, we're up in the clouds. and uh, It was a lot of fun. Like I said, uh, you get to meet a lot of people make a lot of friends, uh, relationships that uh, you never would have dreamed possible. So uh, to me, uh, I highly recommend it. If you get an opportunity to work in an international market, uh, it's a great experience. And uh, 
like I said, if I had to do it all over again, I, I wouldn't change a thing. So with that, we'll open it up to anybody that has a question. Thank you. Um, I know we did, uh, I know when I was both in, in Japan, uh, in fact, it's another sort of a funny story. When we were, uh, opened up the office in Japan, we were looking for translators. And, uh, we did some of that with, with interns. And, uh, we had one guy come over from the University of Texas in Austin a guy named Bob Hartline, and uh, I got to uh, interview Bob, and we were sitting there talking and, you know, asking where he's from. From uh, He said, I'm from Garland, Texas. So that's funny, I'm from Garland, Texas. And he looked at uh, my nameplate on my desk. He says, Wayne Chumley. He said, uh, I had a principal named Chumley in high school. I said, yeah, I said, what was his name? He said, Pat Chumley. I said, yeah, that's my uncle. <laughs> so. Small world. So here I'm sitting in, in Japan, you know, and here's a guy from hometown. But we, we hired Bob. Uh, he came on board as an intern. <coughs> he had majored in Japanese language, and he was very fluent. In fact, on the phone, the Japanese thought they were speaking to a Japanese national. But uh, we hired him as an intern. Uh, he worked a summer. And then when he graduated, we hired him full-time and brought him back. And he went to work in the marketing department. So. Uh, that's just an example, but I think uh, if you search most companies' websites for, uh, for career opportunities, I think you'll be able to find those. In fact, I know Chrysler has a website for uh, internships, and they have a listing of the different places. They even have some here in Dallas. Good question. What else? Yes? How do you in the U.S.? Um, T to me, you know, you, you hear a lot when you're here about, you know, China, it's a communist country, and, but uh, I got to tell you, the Chinese people are, are probably the, the world's greatest entrepreneurs. And I think the government, while, uh, you know, they, they do some, some of the things you hear, they do some very bad things, and they try to keep a very tight control. But they also understand enough that uh, really when you're, you're living there, it's, uh, like I said, they're, they're very uh, opportunistic. They're natural entrepreneurs. Uh, there's probably a, a larger underground economy in China than there is the, uh, the real economy that gets taxed. But it, it was very interesting. Um, you know, the old guard, obviously, in Beijing is still in charge. There's no doubt about that. And they will, they'll swat down any uprisings or demonstrations. But they do encourage business. And uh, their quality of life, I think, is improving quickly and dramatically. And uh, they really encourage, uh, you know, unlike the old Soviet Union where everything was socialism, you know, they had these co-op farms and co-op businesses, a lot of small business owners. And uh, so that, that economy is, is growing, and they really, the government understands they have to keep it growing at double digit rates of about at least 10% a year because that's about the only way they, they can keep uh, the revolts and the unrest under control is that people do see an opportunity for growth that uh, you know that, that if they do work hard they can improve themselves they can make money and you know and I think that that breeds a lot of the problems in the world now especially you know when you look at some of the countries in Africa the Middle East or Pakistan or Afghanistan where you know you know, why would somebody tie a bomb to themselves and blow themselves up? You know, they really don't see a future. They really don't see an opportunity. For it. You know, and I think that the, uh, the old guard government in Beijing, they understand that. So uh, they try to make sure that the people do see that they do have opportunity. Yes? I think it's totally different direction. And you did it really well. Uh, now I have a story 
passion for uh, the athletic world as much as the business world. But what advice can you give us to to students who don't really know what they're going to be doing in the future? That we're not clear with the time. Well, that, that's why uh, you know I tried to. Uh, I gave myself as, as an example. You, you just don't know. You, you think you're going to be doing one thing, and then you, you find out you're doing something else. So I think uh, flexibility. Mm -hmm. You know, be flexible. Keep an open mind. You know, don't get yourself, uh, I know a lot of people seem like they get zeroed in on one path with the blinders on, headed one direction. And, you know, and in some ways that, that's probably good. But for me personally, I think it's better if, if you keep an open mind keep your options open again you know grew up on a farm plan to teach ag and wind up in the car business so you know anything can happen so if, if you just keep an open mind uh, I think the opportunities and the options are out there for anybody that, that really wants to pursue it you know I think uh, one of the worst things is, is someone telling telling you that you can't I hate that I hate to hear people say that because uh, I think, uh, you know, individuals, if you put your mind to it, you know, people are, are capable of great things if we don't put the roadblocks in place. So keep an open mind, uh, don't get discouraged, and don't let people tell you you can't. And in fact, if somebody tells you you can't, that should inspire you to prove them wrong. <laughs> yes? Um, okay, yeah, language uh, can, can be a big issue. I think I'm lucky. Uh, the businesses I worked in, normally we wouldn't hire anyone unless they had at least a, a bachelor's degree. We preferred a master's degree, and we required they had English language capability. Now, that works great in an office environment. But, you know, you can't always stay in the office. And in Korea, if you get outside of the city of Seoul, it might be very difficult to find someone that can speak English. And in China, if you get outside of uh, the larger cities, say a, a Beijing, a, a Shanghai, then you also uh, have problems. But uh, normally I had a, uh, an assistant that was served as a translator. But as, as far as doing business, uh, a lot of the people you talk to or that you work with, it was really amazing to find a lot of these people were educated in the U.S. They, they come to school here and get their degrees here. So they're very familiar with uh, the U.S. operations, how we run business. So there, there's a lot of similarities, but uh, there are a lot of differences. That's why I say I encourage you to study a little bit about the history of the com country. Uh, understand the culture, uh, some of the do's and don'ts. Uh, you know, for example, uh, in Japan, if you're, you're eating rice with the chopsticks, you can never s stick the chopsticks into the rice bowl and live it. That's, uh, that's definitely a, a disaster. Don't do that. <laughs> but, you know, you just need to understand the culture, you know, some of the things. Uh, and some of the nuances, it's, it was always fun in Japan to sit down and have business meetings, and everybody's always smiling and, hi, 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 yes, shaking their head, yes. You think, oh, yeah, they're agreeing with everything you say. And all that means is, yes, we heard you, but no, we're not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you, you'll learn those things, some of the nuances of the, uh, the different cultures. That's a good question. Great question. Thank you. The uh, way it worked out for us, she had a career with American. We got married later in life. Um, we were both in our mid-30s. So she had about a 15-year career with American. Um, whenever I took the, the job in Japan, at that time the economy was a little slow, and uh, American was offering, uh, oh, it, it wasn't... I guess it was like a layoff, 
but she took like a, they gave her five years off. And since we only planned to be gone three to five years, she thought that, that was great. Gave us an opportunity. She got to keep her flight benefits, which was great. So she could fly back and home when she, forth when she needed to. And an opportunity for us to, to start a family and, and raise our children. Um, at the end of the five years, uh, by then we had pretty well established ourselves that we didn't want to come back. We were going to stay. And uh, she was ready to uh, her, change her career and become a, a full-time mom. And she got it very involved. Uh, there's a lot of different support groups. Uh, she got involved with the Americans Women's Club and also uh, on the base at uh, Yongsan, they had a, uh, a thrift shop where people brought in goods, donations, and, and they sold used goods on the shop, and she helped operate that. So, uh, you know, I think the timing, like I say, you know, things just seemed to work out, but for us it worked out very well that way. But uh, a lot of different companies, I know people that, uh, that both the husband and wife were, uh, expats and uh, the company seemed to work with them pretty well that when one moved uh, the other company was able to find a job for the other and it worked not only for the husband but also for the wife um, I had a uh, <coughs> when uh, Daimler bought out Chrysler I had a uh, young lady as my uh, CFO German and they transferred her to Korea to be the uh, chief financial officer well her husband had a good job with the uh, with fag bearing company and uh, so he went and talked to his company and they had an operation in Korea and they arranged to have him transferred to Korea as well so it, it was it was very surprising I, I found that a lot of companies will work that way because uh, and I, I guess it's still that way whenever we first went overseas it was very difficult Chrysler really had a hard time finding people to take these expat assignments. Because again, you're away from home, you're away from your family, you're away from your friends, uh, the way you're used to living, your lifestyle, and uh, just not a lot of people are willing to take that, uh, that step. So uh, when companies find good people that are willing to do this, uh, they'll do everything. They can. They'll bend over backwards to try to support you. Good question. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, well, in, when we first went to Japan, like I said, they sent us up to, uh, to Boulder, University of Colorado, and uh, it was pretty condensed. They, they tried to teach us some, you know, the basics, so, you know, you could get home in a taxi cab or ask where the restroom was, that sort of thing. But uh, as far as becoming an expert in language, uh, no, I, I never did. I mean, I could do simple things like get home in a taxi or, or find the bathroom or order a beer. <laughs> Make you to sell. <laughs> uh, but uh, again, we, we did have people in the office. Uh, I had an assistant that was a, was a translator. So uh, I got by. Uh, the people that, that have those skills, uh, I think it makes much easier if you do have a good command of the language. But what you'll find, uh, especially in the Asian language, uh, Mandarin, whether it's Mandarin, Hangul, uh, Japanese languages, there's so many different levels. There's different languages they speak to friends, different languages you speak to your elders, different languages you speak in business. And when you get in business, again, like I said, English is uh, the international language of business. And a lot of the technical terms are English words, no matter where you are. So that helps a little bit. But uh, yeah, I'm, I guess I'm a, it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks. So I, I had a lot of problem trying to learn languages, other than learning a few of the, you know, like phrases, how to order a beer, get home in a taxi, or find a bathroom. That was about as far as I could go. <laughs> uh, I would recommend it. The, the people that, that do it, it makes it so much easier. But we, we survived for 20 years. So. It can be done. 
Yes, ma'am. I see it. I see it really expanding. Like I said, it, it's a it's a global environment now. Uh, all these these larger companies that they're all international operations because, uh, you know that that's one of the things that kept getting Chrysler in trouble, that it was basically a North American company and and really was only selling vehicles in the U.S., North America, Canada, Mexico. And uh, you know when times were good, we made a lot of money, but then uh, you know if uh, there was a little recession or a little downturn, then didn't take us long, you know, in the auto industry, it's a very cash intensive business and you burn through billions of dollars in a hurry. So, uh, and I think most companies have recognized that, you know, if you're really gonna succeed, you've got to be successful in all these markets because, uh, I mean, our operation, for example, you know, Chrysler and GM both declared bankruptcy here in the U.S. Well, both of those companies were making a ton of money in China. We were very profitable. So, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's very important that uh, to be successful, you just about got to be a global player anymore. It's very hard to succeed just being uh, focused on, on one market. Yes, ma'am. Uh, probably. The one thing I, I'm most proud of, uh, you know, I, I'm very proud of, of what I accomplished setting up the operations uh, in Korea, getting that started from, from startup, from basically nothing and building up a good business. But probably the thing I'm most proud of is the, uh, the scholarship foundation that I was talking about that we set up in AmCham. Uh, like I said, we got 10 companies to ante up 100,000 apiece. Uh, that thing has continued to grow. Um, it now, I think, has uh, a base of about $22 million and supporting over 1,500 students per year. So I'm very proud of that, uh, the work with the USO and uh, work with the Korean government back during the, uh, the economic crisis uh, back in uh, the late 90s. Basically, the, the government of Korea went bankrupt. They were out of money. And uh, went through the bailout and working with them because, uh, you know, how do we get money into the country? How do we get companies to come here and invest? You know, the best way to get money is to, uh, to have some large international companies come in and set up operations and start funding those operations and bring foreign direct investment into the country. But to do that, uh, you have to make the market attractive. You know, why should these companies come here and set up a business? So you have to do some things, give them tax breaks, make it attractive for them to come. Uh, living conditions for expats, schools for the children, housing, you know, you know, we're used to living a certain way and you'll find in, in some of these cultures the way they live, the houses uh, are very, very different. Healthcare is very important. Uh, I think we were, were very fortunate uh, in Seoul, for example, uh, Samsung Hospital was a partnership with, with Johns Hopkins and all those doctors had uh, graduated from Johns Hopkins here in the U.S. And since it was supported by uh, Samsung Corporation, they had all the latest and greatest equipment. So uh, I think we were very fortunate uh, with health care. Um, I even had a gallbladder surgery, my gallbladder removed in Korea. China, uh, most people, we had uh, international clinics, uh, we had a British doctor, but most people, if it came to having surgery, most people, you know, if they were able, they would fly to Hong Kong. So, uh, that was a little bit different. Did that answer your question? <laughs> okay. Oh yes, yeah. You'll run into you run into that in these countries. Uh, I remember when we uh, we first set up uh, the operations in Korea. Had uh, these gentlemen come into the office wanted to meet with me, and they were from the uh, the local tax entity. 
of all places, we were in Gangnam. I guess everybody's seen that, uh, the viral video, Gangnam Style. Uh, <laughs> my, my kids were, were quite excited about that because that's where we lived. But the local tax authorities had come in and uh, they wanted to meet and uh, they were there to, to collect their bribes for us to do business. And uh, which, uh, you know, I had heard of this, that it would happen, but I was you know, still a little shocked that they just come into my office and brazenly, brazenly looking for their handout. And of course, uh, with, with Chrysler and of course the way American business, I just had to tell them, sorry, I can't do that. We're an American company and if I do that, I go to jail. So, uh, yeah, it did cause some problems. And that's, again, why I got involved in AmCham and working with the embassy and also with the, some of the uh, work I was doing with the Korean government to, to try to help uh, smooth the way. It's gotten a lot better. I mean, uh, they, they put, uh, I mean, when I first went to Korea, it seemed like uh, every time a, a president finished his term, within the next two years, he was in jail. <laughs> for corruption. So, uh, but they've really worked hard to, to try to clean that up. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I've heard of that. Uh, when we were part of Daimler, I know that uh, they got into trouble because, uh, especially in a lot of the African company countries, um, I hadn't been there, but they said that uh, most of the trucks in a lot of these countries were Mercedes-Benz. Uh, a lot of the government vehicles, official vehicles were Mercedes-Benz. And the reason was uh, that uh, was the payoffs to government officials. And in fact, uh, I think up until about five years ago, uh, you know, payoffs to government officials were actually tax deductible in Germany. So I, I thought that was a little bit odd. But uh, yeah, when they did list on the New York Stock Exchange, uh, they did run amok of the uh, of U.S. regulations, and I think uh, they wound up paying like a five billion dollar fine some of the, uh, the payoffs that have been made to the different government officials in, in Africa. So, yeah, you run into it, but, uh, you know, I think the best way is, is just what I did, just tell them, sorry, we, we cannot do that. So how did they take that after they were told it was? No, we, uh, we had some problems. Uh, you know, we're trying to get cars certified to sell or, or get the, uh, the tax stamps that you need, and they would slow walk stuff and, and try to make it difficult. But again, as I got involved in AmCham and got to know some of the uh, the uh, different uh, government officials a little higher up and, and got to know their bosses, then uh, I could call them and say, hey, these guys are giving me a hard time. Okay. And it, it would mm -hmm. get smoothed over. That's why I say you have to uh, be very flexible and you know find different ways around different problems. It makes it quite interesting. Never a dull moment, and it's never the same thing every day. <laughs> yes. Uh, what fraternity were you Alpha Gamma Rho, Ag, Ag fraternity, Alpha Gamma Rho, AGR. What's that? Weirdest thing. Oh, weirdest. Oh my God. <laughs> Well, I was, we were invited to a special dinner one night in Korea with a, a chairman of a very large company that I, I won't name, but uh, it was a very traditional, very small, very exclusive, small, uh, traditional Korean restaurant. And they brought this soup, and it was steaming hot, and when they took the lid off, there were all these little tentacles just, just moving. And it, it was squid, and they'd cut up. I guess boiled it alive and, and cut up the tentacles. And it was pretty weird because, you know, when you go to eat these, they would stick to your <laughs> lips or your mouth, and my wife wouldn't touch it. That one was kind of strange. But probably the weirdest one was, uh, I was telling you about the trip to the airport on the back of the motorcycle. Well, those guys, those guys had taken me out, and uh, their big deal for uh, uh, treating special guest was snake. So you're sitting in a private room in a restaurant and they bring in all these snakes and they pick out the snake. And uh, you're sitting there in a room and they 
they picked out the snake, they lopped the head off, and they drained the blood out of it. So, yeah, drink, yeah, so you have to drink snake's blood, and then as the guest of honor, you, you get the, uh, it's a big honor to have the uh, raw snake's liver. So I got to sample that. But I never tried the live scorpions and the spiders or any of that. Some of the bugs are pretty good, but spiders and, and scorpions, I, I wouldn't go there. So was your assistant always with you so that you could transfer the information? Yeah, okay. yeah usually there was somebody there. Did they get engaged in you after that? Uh, yeah, I think compared most you, you'll find in, in Korea and in China, they want to work for international companies because if they do have English language capabilities, they, they do make more money than they can in a local company. But yeah, for the local economy, they, they, make, they make pretty good money. Whew, wished I had known. If I'd probably known what I was getting into, maybe I'd never gone. <laughs> no, that's not true. Like I said, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, I, I wish probably that I, that I did. We talked about the language. I wish I had had the capability. I mean, uh, I'm amazed. You look at, at Europeans, uh, like I said, when we were part of a Daimler, spent a lot of time in Europe too. But most Europeans, you know, they speak minimum four or five languages. And they can go fluently from, you know, to French, to German, to Italian, to Spanish, just English. You know, and I have a hard time speaking English. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that, that's the one thing I wish that I, that I had had uh, some uh, foreign language capability. I think that would have been a... Like I said, that to me, that's a great help. If you, if you can, if you do have the capability and, and you can retain it and learn it, that, uh, that I would highly encourage that because that, that sure would make your life a lot easier. We probably have time for one more question. We don't have to keep on. Oh, you got to turn it in. Yes, ma'am. How do you kind of take it over in like the next 10 years once the economy uh, Yeah, I think they'll, they'll, they'll pass the U.S. probably within the next 10 years. So then you're just keeping it. I mean, it, it's just... <laughs> it's just the, the economy of scale. I mean, it, it's such a large. Years, right? hmm? You said two years? Ten years. <laughs> ten years. <laughs> no, no, ten years. <laughs> they're, they're, they're growing very quickly, but, uh, yeah, I, th I think they're a good ten years away. But, I mean, it's just the economy of scale. It, it's such a large country. Uh, there, there's just, you know, so many people, 1.2 billion people. Uh, and, uh, like I said, they're, they're, they're growing about 10% a year now. I mean, it was just uh, really strange. You know, it's, it's a long flight. I got used to it in Korea. You know, if you flew somewhere, you know, from one end of South Korea to the other, it's only about 450 kilometers. So, you know, you're a 30-minute flight from any place. Uh, from uh, Shanghai to uh, Iramuchi, which is the far western edge of, of the country, was a six-hour flight. And then going from maybe Beijing down to uh, Guangzhou was about a four-hour flight. I mean, it's some huge differences, some huge distances. But, uh, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That was interesting. My pleasure. Thank you. But before you leave, yes. we do have something for you. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, not a snake. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Very good. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed meeting all of you and, and having the chance to come visit with you and, and hope uh, you learned a little bit. Hope that helped you out. Hope to see you in international market someday. <laughs>